see me running this fat bitch. Follow management, O skin on sparks, Indy 500. How did your fucking dog know rap? I let my life on the edge and y'all don't wanna push me. Pussy. Mommy keep giving me head cause I don't want your pussy. Nope. A fascist bastard, meshing with that matic. Any petty drama, I promise. The rat attack, tatted, faggy, and get ghosts on them. Ghosts on Niggas em. still got that smoke on them. Didn't realize he provoked the photo to burn them. Burn Who the fuck caught him? This stupid nigga ain't learning. I'm a hustler. All I see is green like Eric Sherman. Crap. Used to pack AM yeah, baggies, so by my daddy Led to me locked in the creek smoking caddy Tuck in my swaggy, this is gangsta Educated right stuff, music right star player right Holla at your right neighbor in right Not producing, right chill with bitches in the boogie down boogie Pulling down. my hoodie down, pit stop All them world girls came, took me round Dice game, tuck them and shake them, buck them and break them Grip, nice chain, fuck the equation, I got that eight, man in and out of ten, I'm cracked with a duffel, I bring stacks back Ride that Peter Pan, stress in that struggle, bring cats back Side them on Grey Hanna, where you hustle, make, make that Mac go Blech. Turn your corner in the rubble Like I said in the first episode of this series, the sad thing about dynasties are that unfortunately, almost all of them have to come to an end no king can rule forever. The good thing though, is that the legacy of those dynasties will live on forever through the members of that dynasty and the people who will forever have memories of the glory days. I know some people in the comments have said that Rockefeller wasn't the best label because only Jay was really selling. And I mean, that's not all the way true because other people besides Jay went platinum and gold. Kim went platinum and gold along with Dipset who went gold. Bleak has two gold albums. Beanie has a gold album. Kanye went multi-platinum with multiple albums, but one album in their prime, if you want to look at it like that, etc. The thing about Rockefeller is that, yeah, maybe collectively with everybody, they didn't sell the most records, but the talent that they had was truly undeniable. I mean, you had Jay-Z, who people consider to be one of the best rappers ever, and Beanie Sigel, who a lot of people think is one of the most underrated rappers ever. The Young Guns, who were absolutely fire. And come on, man, like Neef was fire. But Young Chris was just different. All respect to Neef, and I mean no disrespect to anyone at all, but Young Chris was crazy nice. Freeway's first album is a classic. I don't care what anyone says, Freeway can really, really spit. Oshkino and Emilio was nice in their own rights. PD Crack, along with Oshkino and Emilio, never got a solo album. But PD was super duper fire. That freestyle I played in the intro, classic, classic. Prime PD over Just Blaze and Kanye Beats would have been nasty. Then you had Dipset, who had a whole movement along with State Property in their own right. But if you break down Dipset, then you have Cameron, who was a star in his own right. And to me, minus the politics and all that, he could have really, really took over the rap game after Jay left and been one of them ones and would have been one of, if not the face of the rock. Then you have Jewels, who was the prince, assumed to be the king, just like P.D. Crack. But instead, Jewels got a chance to release a solo album. Jewels was a young and up and comer, and he was hungry for that top spot. Bleak was doing his thing, and I know I said a couple things about Bleak and how he was under J, but all that aside, Bleak was actually nice back in the day, and you do not go gold twice for no reason at all. And on top of that, you have DJ Clue. I mean, like, is we like being serious here? Obviously, that's not everybody on the rock, but even though people might look at the sales, the potential all these people had was insane. It's just sad things ended the way that they did. Just imagine if that never happened and where the rap game would be now. Before I get more into the video, I would first like to thank you guys for coming to see this because you guys can be doing a million other things right now, but instead, you're here with me and I appreciate that. If you guys like the content, you guys should like, comment, and subscribe to help the channel grow. I reply to all the comments and I love going through them and seeing what you guys think. Also, follow my Instagram too. That would be greatly appreciated. You guys can DM me some video ideas or just show me some love. It's all good. Comment down below your favorite artist or group on The Rock and why. Favorite project, favorite mixtape. Also, represent where you're from in the comment section below. I want to see where y'all are tuning in at. Definitely represent where you're from. 
Without further ado, I give you the documentary of Rockefeller, Part 4, The Fall of the Rock. What I'm about to do before I get into the nitty gritty of what this video is about, which is what led to the fall of Rockefeller, I'm about to give a synopsis of what happened to Rockefeller after 2005, before we break down what happened to people individually. When Jay split from Damon Biggs, basically the roster of people that were signed to Rockefeller had to make a choice. Do you want to go with Damon Biggs or go with Jay-Z? I saw an interview with Emilio on DJ Vlad and he said that it wasn't like that and that literally they ripped a piece of a sheet in half and one sheet went with Jay and the other went with Dame. These are two completely different things and I say this all the time that I was not there during these events and literally in 2005 I was like four depending on when it happened but I'm just trying to give multiple perspectives from different people of what happened in these events. Despite this, from my knowledge, Beanie, MOP, Cam with Dipset and some others went with Dame. Dame also brought ODB's masters to the rapper's album, A Son Unique with him, but to this day it has never been released. The Young Guns, Bleak, Kanye, and Freeway, along with some others, went with Jay. Dame would start to get his new label up and going, initially calling it Rock for Life, before changing it to Damon Dash Music Group. It was set to still be an imprint under Universal, but not under the control of Def Jam, which Jay-Z was president of. To add the reason why this was probably done is because Dame probably didn't want to have to report to Jay-Z. Dame Dash's deal would soon fall apart after allegedly constantly pissing off executives by trying to get a bigger role in Universal to get to the same level as Jay-Z was because Jay was the president of Dev Jam at this time. People also have been asking what happened to Rockaware and the deal that happened with Rockaware is that Rockaware grew to be a big company. Just a couple things on how big it was is that in just 2002, the brand racked up a sales of about 120 million. And in 2003, they had sales of over 300 million. In 2005, Rockaware had sales of over 700 million. Dame has said that he sold his interest in Rockaware to be completely independent and he sold his share in the company for $22 million. Now, $22 million is a lot of money. I'm not even going to front like it's not because just for a regular everyday person, that is a lot of money. Jay-Z would sell the rights to the Rockaware brand to the Iconics brand group for $204 million and will retain his stake in the company and at this point will continue to oversee the marketing, licensing, and product development. Jesus, I know Dame was hurting when that happened. Man, if he kept his share, he would have had $51 million because Jay-Z had a quarter along with Dame. But back to the label though. After the breakup of Dame, Biggs, and Jay in 2004, Rockefeller was not the same at all, but people were still dropping on the label. Tierra Marie dropped her debut album in 2005, which had poor sales, which ended up in her being dropped from the label. Also in 2005, the label Rock La Familia was established and was a sub-label that focused on signing international acts. Only two official albums have been dropped on this label, and it was Hector L. Father's Los Rompe Discotecas and Nori's Nori y La Familia Ya Tu Sabe. Both projects would release in 2006. Houston-based Colombian rapper Aztec Escobar was the first artist signed to the label, and the other people on the label were Dimitri L. Boss and True Life. The label is now defunct, and it's a shame because it just seems like this was way ahead of its time in regards to how international music is now, where we have artists like Bad Bunny, Daddy Yankee, who's been out for a long time, but he's really popping in the scene, and IUL. I don't think any of y'all know this, but alongside me being black, I'm actually Native American and Mexican. I actually really mess with reggaeton and Latin music heavy. Growing up, my mom used to play that music all the time, especially Daddy Yankee. She used to also play a lot of Sean Paul, which is dance hall in Jamaican, which I'm also really into. My music taste is very diverse, and y'all only really get to hear me talk about rap in my videos. But if I told y'all all what I listen to, y'all would like lose y'all minds. Like I can literally go from listening to some Beanie Man, then turn on some Rage Against the Machine, then some Roger 
Troutman, to some Isley Brothers, to some Tupac, then to some Playboy Cardi. Like, it's just really like a crazy scene. Let's skip to 2009, where Jadakiss would release his third studio album, The Last Kiss. Jadakiss had briefly moved to Rockefeller during this time, and he began recording this album in 2008. The album had been delayed multiple times until it released in April of 2009, where the album peaked at number three on the Billboard 200, selling 134,000 copies in its first week. The next year in 2010, Dame Dash would come back into the music industry and attempt to sign the rapper Currency and get him to sign him to Blue Rock Records, which was a subdivision of Damon Dash's DD172 which was a media collective. If y'all don't know, I'm a big Currency fan. And I actually did a video on him way back when I had like 50 subscribers. So you guys should definitely go check that out though. Unfortunately, in 2012, Currency filed a lawsuit against Dame for releasing two of his projects, Pilot Talk 1 and 2, without his permission after their business deal didn't work out together. And Currency was with Warner Bros. Music. Currency claimed that Dame didn't have the rights to his music, nor did he give him that permission. In 2005, Dame and Currency was settled out of court for an undisclosed amount. The last record to ever be released on Rockefeller was Magna Carta Holy Grail, which is Jay-Z's 12th studio album. This album would truly finally be the end of Rockefeller Records. However, in 2008, Rock Nation was founded by Jay-Z after securing a multi-year partnership with live events company Live Nation. Rock Nation is a full service management, music publishing, and entertainment company. On the music side of things, Rock Nation has some pretty big artists under their belt, such as DJ Khaled, Rihanna, J. Cole, Meek Mill, Lil Uzi Vert, Megan Thee Stallion, etc. Now it's time to get into what happened to most of the people after the split of Rockefeller Records in 2004. We'll start with Beans, and after the split, he was originally with Dame Dash, who he had released his third studio album, The Be Coming With, in March of 2005. The album was completed before Beanie served jail time in 2004. After this, Beanie ended up re-signing with Rockefeller Records in 2006, where he would then release his fourth studio album, The Solution, in December of 2007. After this, Beanie would release a few more projects after his contracts with Rockefeller Records and Def Jam Records had expired. I know at one point of time, Beanie was supposed to sign a deal with G-Unit after he got out of prison, but Jay-Z refused to release him from Def Jam in 2005. According to Beanie, 50 Cent wanted to give him a whole label deal and a whole lot of money, but Jay refused to release him. Jay would say that he would see what he could do, but that see what he could do turned into a whole other two years for Beans. The Young Guns released their second and last studio album and last album on Rockefeller, Brothers from Another, in May of 2005. The sales of the project were somewhat of a disappointment compared to how their first album did. The album got decent exposure from the Swizz Beats produced lead single, Set It Off, promotion from Jay-Z himself, along with other things. After this, the Young Guns would release solo music throughout the years and would last release a mixtape together in 2005 called Back to Business. The two would then embark on solo careers and release their own projects. PD Crack's career was greatly affected by state property dissolving in the split of Rockefeller. After the split, PD was considered a free agent and Dame wanted to have a meeting with PD. PD would then go to the meeting and notice some things were awfully off. He noticed that normally when he was around Dame and his people that they usually took shots of Armandale, but today they were drinking out of the bottle and telling him to drink a bottle and he kept doing toast. <laughs> like, that's just crazy. But yeah, PD got drunk and then Dame pulled out the paperwork and PD said that he was signing Dame for the right price. Petey said a number and then Dame offered him ten to fifteen thousand dollars according to Petey. Like <laughs> crazy. But I'm sorry, but like Dame, like that was just wild. This is a wild counter offer. But Petey said that they used to make that at certain shows. So that's kinda like an insult in my opinion. 
But Dame would then call Beans to talk to Petey. But Petey told Beans that he wasn't getting enough bread from Dame. So Beanie told Petey to take his Rockefeller chain off and give it to Dame because Petey was at the time wearing Beanie's Rockefeller chain. Petey would then thank Dame and Biggs and walk out, but someone would come out and say that Dame added another 5000 on whatever he proposed to Petey, and Petey just ignored it and laughed it off. Like, <laughs> dude, once again, that's just a crazy story. But Petey would then eventually go back to Jay-Z and keep the same contract that he had before the split and work on his debut album that never got to see the light of day. In 2008, Petey was released from his contract and he made a couple diss tracks toward Jay-Z. But now in retrospect, Petey does appreciate the shot that Jay gave him. Freeway stayed with Jay after the breakup and took a lengthy hiatus. In an interview, Freeway said, I just been grinding, you know, the whole rock breakup really took a toll on me and kind of even held my career up a little bit. But I've been working and I'm ready to get back out. It was a couple of things. The whole family structure wasn't in place like it was. There was a time when I could just go to baseline and knock it out, but it wasn't like that this time. Freeway would drop his second studio album, Free At Last, in November of 2007, where his album peaked at number 42 on the Billboard Hot 100 chart, selling 36,000 copies during his first week. It was first reported Jay-Z was stepped down as president of Def Jam in December of 2007, and shortly after this, Freeway announced his release from Def Jam. Freeway throughout the years would still continue releasing projects, and he would eventually end up reconnecting with Beanie Siegel. After the Rockefeller split, Oshkino went with Dame Dash, and the reason for this is because in an interview, Oshkino said that you can't call Jay-Z and ask for $10,000 because you don't even know his phone number. He said that Dame did right by him because when Oshkino got shot and he needed an appointment out in New Jersey, Dame got it done and also paid $3,600 a month for Oshkino's rent. Before doing my research on this video, I didn't really know a whole lot about Oshkino. This man has gave a lot of insight behind what was going on in Rockefeller. Oshkino has called out Jay-Z for numerous things. Give It To Me on the Rock La Familia album was originally his and Emilio's song, but Oshkino was in jail for murder at the time, and Jay-Z would add himself to the song, and Emilio just had the hook. He said that 1-900-Hustler was originally Freeway's song by himself. Ashkino also said that Jay was very shook during the Nas beat and actually sent the people on the label to go at him. And the phrase that Jay would always say, according to Ashkino, was act like they killed your cousin. <laughs> but I'm sorry, but that's just hilarious and funny at the same time. But, but Ashkino also said that Jay-Z used to steal raps. And he said that Jay would always have everybody rap their bars to him. And if he didn't have any bars offhand, that it was a problem. He said Jay-Z remembered every single word, which is just crazy in itself. There's always been allegations of Jay biting people. We all know Cam, Nas, and other people accused him of taking rhymes from Biggie. But I've seen people accuse him of taking rhymes from Young Chris especially. And really running with the whole Philly flow and everything. I think that people really say this around the Blueprint 2 era, which will make a lot of sense because according to Wayno, Jay-Z pulled young Chris in around that time because Chris was going through a rough time due to his friend passing, I believe, and Jay really took him in under his wing and had him with him every day and they were doing a lot of music. If you're from Philly, tell me what you think. Was Jay out here stealing y'all style like that? But yeah, Emilio and Sparks both had their own things going after The Rock, and I'm not trying to get too, too deep into it and state property, because one day in the future, I want to maybe, keyword maybe, do a state property doc. Don't ask me when, because I have no clue at this moment. Like, I'm so backed up on these videos due to this doc literally taking, like, for, for almost two months. But yeah, but there's a lot of other videos I want to get out. But yeah, it's definitely on my list, like 100%, definitely on my list. Cameron, after the split of Rockefeller, would join Warner Music Group under the Asylum Records imprint in 2005, and he would begin to work on his first project for the new label that ended up being titled Killer Season, which was released in May of 2006. On Killer Season, Cameron had, to me, one of the most underrated diss tracks of all time, if you ever heard it, and it's You Gotta Love It with Max B. 
I believe this is my third time talking about this on my channel, but yo, but I don't want to beat it to death by saying that this song is wild, but yo, but it's just an understatement. If you haven't heard it yet, go look it up. But those who have know what I mean by Cam went in on Jay for multiple things. Cam said that Jay stole Rockaware, Rockefeller, and Kanye West from Dame Dash. The Kanye part is low-key kind of true in my opinion because Dame did sign Kanye, as we said in the last episode. Back then, even though Kanye was trying to rap, people still overlooked him as a producer. Jay did, Dame did, everybody did. But when that deal that we talked about got pulled from Kanye, from my knowledge, it was Dame that signed him. Then Cam said that when he got shot before this album was released, he saw the shooter throw up a diamond sign. Cam was wildin' and even said, how was Jay-Z an 80s baby when he was born in 1968? Which is false because Jay was actually born in 1969, but still, you get it. How was Jay-Z the king of New York wearing chancletas and jeans? Like, <laughs> that line breaks, that line cracks me up every time. And he said that he had Beyonce singing about crack on his second album on the song Do It Again, which is actually true. Like, she was singing about crack with Destiny Child. Like, Cam was wigging. Nowadays, Jay and Cam are on much better terms. Not friends, but on better terms. One thing people don't really know is that, of course, we all know Jay and Cam didn't really get along, but Jay never prevented Cam from dropping music while Cameron was on Rockefeller. Cam and other people have said that despite all the drama between them, I believe Cam needed five or six signatures, and Jay-Z was one of them, and he always signed off. So I do commend Jay for that because that was 100. Since The Rock, Cam has dropped a ton of projects and still manages to stay relevant. His Instagram is pure comedy. And I must say, like, this dude is still hilarious. And his latest release, Purple Haze 2, is actually really solid. Cam has still got the bars. Joel Santana will release his second studio album, What the Game's Been Missing, through Diplomat and Dev Jam Records in November 2005. The album peaked at number 9 on the Billboard 200, selling 141,000 copies in its first week. The album did well, and Joel's was on fire at this time, especially since earlier that year, Joel's was featured on Chris Brown's Run It, which went number 1 on the Billboard Hot 100 for 5 straight weeks weeks absolutely crazy after this duels would go on a legendary mixtape run with Lil wayne which i'm actually thinking about doing a video about would start skull gang and dipset would break up due to a multitude of things but mainly the tension with jim jones and cameron due to the whole 50 cent situation but i went more in depth with that with my dipset video when Joel's was at his peak, he was so unstoppable with that pen. And it's a shame that he never dropped another album after 2005. He had all the talent in the world, but man, it just sucks. Like, it truly does hurt. Something I did find out, though, about Joel's is that when I was doing research, I came across a DJ Vlad interview where Vlad interviewed Choke No Joke, who, if y'all don't know Choke No Joke, he was a former Rockefeller videographer who worked a lot with Dame Dash, and it's the least to say that he's an interesting figure. I've seen people hate on Choke and praise him, but one thing that I will say is that that man has a lot of footage of Rockefeller in the prime, that is gold, and you guys should definitely check it out on his channel. He has some great clips, but his opinions and what he said about Jay-Z, Dame, Biggs, and other people make him a controversial figure, which I hate using that word to describe him, but anyways, we'll get into him in the next section. What he said in the interviews is that there was a state property dipset tour, but Jay-Z started pulling people off of the tour for the Rock the Mic tour. Kevin Lyles wanted to put Foxy Brown on the tour, but Dame thought that Foxy Brown was a liability. So he suggested Jewels go on tour because Jewels was hot at the time. Dev Jam had an extra $5,000, so Dame allegedly suggested they give Jewels the money but they declined and said that they would give Jewels $2,500 a show out of his marketing budget. Ladies and gentlemen, that is super grimy. Jewels probably, until now, honestly didn't know that he was getting paid this money out of his marketing budget. He's getting this money, probably thinking it's from a promoter, but instead it's out of his own marketing budget. And he's probably blowing through it, thinking that it's his and not something that he has to pay back. 
That is the ultimate foul, in my opinion. What do you guys think of that? Now, Jim and Freaky, I believe, were under Rockefeller, but just under Dipset. But as a solo artist, Jim went to Koch Records. As we know, Jim would get red hot in 2006 when he dropped We Fly High. I know I was super young at the time, but for some reason, I do remember hearing this song a lot as a kid. And it was one of my favorite songs. I used to say ballin' literally out of nowhere when I was in school, when I was super young. But yeah, but Jim has still been releasing music throughout the years. And now he's currently under Rock Nation. Memphis Bleak would stay with Jay-Z, of course. I mean, like, why wouldn't he? Like, that? like that's his man. But Bleak would drop his last album as of today in May of 2005, titled 534. To me, this is a really good album by Bleak and probably my favorite album by him. But to me personally, as I said in a previous episode, that the thing that stopped Bleak from being a superstar was being Jay-Z's protege. To me, their relationship should have been more like a Jewels and Cameron. Obviously, Cam was not as big as Jay at his peak, but still, Jewels had things outside of Cam and Dipset that he's done. Like I said earlier, with him going number one for five straight weeks with Chris Brown and his classic mixtape series with Wayne. You know what I'm trying to say? I'm not trying to disrespect Bleak, but you know what's sad? When the most streamed song on music platforms by you is Dear Summer with Jay-Z. You're not even on the song at all. Even Bleak has admitted that Jay's lines on the remix of Kanye West's late registration lead single, Diamonds, hurt his career. The line goes, Bleak could be one hit away his whole career. As long as he's alive, he's a millionaire. And even if I die, he's in my will somewhere. So he could just kick back and chill somewhere. Oh yeah, he don't even have to write rhymes. The dynasty like my money, last three lifetimes. Bleak at the 534 would never end up making another album. But as of now, he has his own label under Rock Nation, which is Warehouse Music Group. He signed acts like Manolo Rose and Casanova. Kanye West obviously stayed with Jay-Z and come on. Like, what can I say about Kanye that y'all already don't know? I mean, the man has, in my opinion, you know, it's not even like a, like a pain no more. He surpassed Jay-Z. Yeah, like the man that was once looked down on has now surpassed his, I don't know what you would refer to Jay as from Kanye's point of view, a mentor, a friend. I don't know, but yeah, I mean, I might get some hate for that, but you're delusional if you don't think that he surpassed Jay-Z by now. In my opinion, I mean, musically, he has the most classics in the rap genre ever. I think Jay has maybe four or five, with the four being Reasonable Doubt, Volume 2, Hard Knock Life, The Blueprint, and The Black Album. To me, Kanye has seven. The College Dropout, Late Registration, Graduation, 808's Heartbreaks, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, Jesus in the life of Pablo. In Jay's case, you can maybe argue five, but I don't know. But it doesn't really matter if Kanye has seven. But anyways, like, <laughs> Kanye has done well for himself. And at one point in time, him and Jay were really close, especially when they made the Watch the Throne album, which is another classic if you want to add it to both of their tallies. But I was only counting solo albums. But if that's the case, then I had to add Kid See Ghost by Kanye and Kid Cudi, because... To me, that's a classic. But yeah, but we definitely need a Watch the Throne too, man. Like, for real. But tell me in the comments who has the most classics between the two and why. Also, Kanye has been killing it with his Yeezy brand of sneakers, which reportedly brought in an estimated $1.7 billion in sales in 2020. Dame since the breakup. I mean, I don't even know where to begin. Obviously, we know Dame tried to make a comeback with his own label, but it didn't really go according to plan. Dame has still managed to be a talked about figure years after the fall of Rockefeller, whether he's talking about being a boss or talking about Jay-Z. I know currently he has Dame Dash Studios and he's working on getting that really going. Now we go on to Biggs because this is actually really funny. I actually had to come back after all this was done to write about Biggs because I really forgot about him. Like Biggs was so in the background of things and he wasn't out and about like that. I mean, you got Jay, who was one of, if not the hottest rappers during when Rockefeller was in his prime. So he was always getting media attention. Dame Dash was literally everywhere and in everything. So he was getting a ton of attention too. And Biggs was rarely in stuff. 
the only videos I can recall off the top of my head that Biggs was in was the Dipset Anthem video and the one for Petey Crack video. He's probably in more, but let me tell you that that number is way less than Dame Dash. Like, Dame is in everything. Dame was in, like, every video doing the funniest but craziest stuff, like, I swear. Like, it's easier to name what videos Dame is not in than the one that he's in. But yeah, Biggs has done well after Rockefeller. Biggs has executive produced films like OG and It's a Hard Truth, Ain't It? Then getting back into music and starting his management company, Circle of Success, and then signing artists like St. John, who had a huge hit, Roses Remix, which has over a billion streams on Spotify alone. Crazy. And now Biggs is back connected and cool with Jay-Z, which leads to Dame being the I one out. I know Dame and Jay appear to have settled their differences in 2013, but since then, Dame and Jay haven't had the best relationship, and it's kind of sad. I really want everybody to be cool again, but there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that we do know, but a ton that we don't know. The next part, we'll get into some of those topics. But finally, we get to Jay-Z, and just like Kanye, I think that we all know about Jay and what he's done since the Rockefeller breakup. We all know Jay came out of retirement with the Kingdom Come album, and for a while, he was dropping album after album again, with his last album, as of right now, being 444, which released in June of 2017. Him and Beyonce are still together and have three kids with each other. And as mentioned earlier, Jay-Z has been doing great and has elevated since the Rockefeller breakup. Whether it's with his dealings with Rock Nation, Tidal, the Nets, in which he actually had a stake of 1 15th of 1% in the Nets, which was valued at $350,000, and his stake in Barclays, which he had 1 5th of 1%, which was worth two million dollars as of 2021 it is projected i believe that jay-z is a billionaire along with kanye west i do know jay's net worth jumped by 40 percent following his lvmh and square inc deals okay now we're about to get into the real reason why we're here in this next section i'm going to dive into some reasons why rockefeller broke up Let's start off with the clip of Jay in 2003 talking about how him and Dame were growing apart. What is the, I mean, what is, where did this come from and what is the status of well, it? Well, if you see people like me and Dame, we'd be together every day because mm -hmm. we was, our, our drive was for Rockefeller. You know what I'm saying? So we didn't have anything else to do. So we'd be together every day. Every day, our waking day, we was worried about doing something else to make Rockefeller grow. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, we'd jump in the van, we'd go to Maryland, we'd go anywhere. You know what I'm saying? And um, now we got our focus is everywhere, mm -hmm. different things. There's Rock Aware, there's state property, there's, you know, there's Armadale, there's so many different things, as well as things that we always want to do on our own, mm -hmm. which is, you know, when, when people see that, you know, it's drifting apart. We've always been polar opposites, you know what I'm saying? But, um, but when people see us drifting apart and doing different things like that, it, it leads to like talking and then that just grows and it grows and uh -huh. um but I mean I'm I'm the kid's uh you know I'm his son's godfather you know what I'm saying that's my brother me and him um we work to, to this thing happen and we both realize our dreams together so we gonna always have that bond uh -huh. so it's, it's it's not a beef it's just that it's just growing Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That sometimes growing means growing apart, not in a bad way. Mm -hmm. Like I like getting into like a L.A., you know, like I said, baby face situation. You mm -hmm. know, we all got things that we want to do. and We want to do separately. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Which is cool. Like I'm happy for him. You know what I mean? As well as, you know, he's happy for me. It's just that it's part of life. It's a part of growing up. There's also another video of Jay-Z breaking down him and Dame Dash's relationship in 2002. Um, Dame Dash and Jay-Z. Yeah. A lot of people thought that the two of you were feuding over mm -hmm. business issues. Right. What is, I mean, can you clarify that for the The thing public? about me and Dame is like whatever we, whatever we, whatever we don't agree on, you know, we can always talk to each other and we can always, whether I'm wrong or whether he's wrong or whatever, we can always see our way through it. It's never a problem that we can't see our way through it and people just blew it up to be more than what it was. I mean, it's what we've been doing for forever. Mm -hmm. You know, we're two different people, you know what I'm saying? He's a loud guy, I'm a laid back guy. Like we, you know what I'm saying? It's gonna be times where we don't, we're not on 100% on the same page, but we, 
with friends. You know what I'm saying? We came in this thing. We built this from nothing. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Nothing. Like, you know, taking our own records, getting them pressed up ourselves. So there's nothing that we can't see our way through. Mm -hmm. So this last part, we're going to break it down into three sections. I've watched a ton of interviews, read articles, etc. To basically come up with three main reasons why Rockefeller Records broke up. The three reasons are three simple reasons. Money, women, and power slash ego. I have heard different stories from multiple different people in interviews from people that were affiliated with Rockefeller backing this up. Of course, there is way more than three reasons why Rockefeller broke up, but I'm just saying from what I've researched, these are the three main reasons that I have really came across. Let's start off with money. So we all know that Dame Dash, Jay-Z and Biggs all had their part in ownership of Rockefeller, which meant that they had to split the money three different ways. There's been stories that Jay-Z was allegedly getting tired of splitting money three ways, and that Jay was upset with his position on Forbes due to this. Rockefeller made a lot of money, but they also spent a lot of money, and the person that a lot of people put on the blame for that is Dame Dash. For those who are familiar with Dame, at least back in the day, is that Dame was blowing through money. In Dame's own words, he was popping tags every day, and he wouldn't wear things like shoes more than once, which I mean, like I hear like a lot of celebrities do that, but still, like that's still like really crazy to me. But Dame had an expensive taste, private jets, literally everywhere, frequent shopping, butlers, personal chefs, etc. In an interview with DJ Vlad, Petey Crack told a story about how Damon Biggs just randomly picked him up from Baseline Studio, which was in New York, might I add, and took him to Chicago to go to Twista's video shoot with R. Kelly. They were only there for about an hour, and then they hop back on the jet and go to Vegas to catch a Floyd Mayweather fight, and then they went to a Tyler Kweli concert. Then after that, they flew to Hollywood and chilled out for there a little bit, and then flew back home. According to Petey, this all happened in one day, which is actually really, really insane. Then I saw an interview with Beanie Siegel on Global Grind TV, and he said that Dame was spending a lot of company money. This is something that I've also read and heard from multiple people that were there around Rockefeller. Dame was going on these trips, going into different business ventures, taking money from one thing and trying to build other brands without consulting his other partners and things of that nature. Now, we get into the second part of the downfall, which is women. Now, I don't know much about the behind the scenes women, but the main ones I want to discuss is Beyonce and Aaliyah. According to Choke No Joke, he said that Jay was actually messing with Aaliyah before Dame but hinted that the reason why Jay never really went public with Aaliyah was because Jay had an image to uphold. Jay allegedly wanted to keep the player image at the time, and maybe it was something else, but other than less, they never went public with whatever they had. Dame would then also slide in on Aaliyah, and also according to Choke No Joke, Dame probably used Jay not fully committing to his advantage to lure Aaliyah away from Jay, because we all know that Dame committed to Aaliyah, but unfortunately Aaliyah would pass away in August of 2001. R.P. Aaliyah, by the way, such a talented individual gone too soon. A while later, Jay-Z and Beyonce would become official, even though they were allegedly creeping around for a little minute before they became public. But yeah, when they became public, it was a big thing. It's alleged that Dame tried to holler at Beyonce and do something similar to what he did with Aaliyah, but Jay was not having that at all. How someone acts around people says a lot about them. But if you're a guy, how you act around women really says a lot about you. Jay was probably not feeling how Dame kept on trying to pull away the girls he had from him. One time was probably like, a, you know what, like it's whatever. But a second time, it's like a yeah, like I'm really like raising my eyebrow for sure. What's weird is that years later, Jay-Z would infamously cheat on Beyonce. And after that news got out, Beyonce made the album Lemonade. And in the song, she talks about a girl named Becky with good hair. Now, there's a ton of speculation of who the heck Becky with the good hair is, but people speculate that allegedly Becky with the good hair is actually Rachel Roy. You wanna know who Rachel Roy's ex-husband is? Dame Dash, like, 
So that just made the Dame Hove situation just so much weirder if that's actually true. The third part of the downfall of Rockefeller is power slash ego. Many of y'all know how Dame Dash is and how he acts now and used to act back in the day. Just Blaze said in an interview with DJ Vlad that Dame is a great guy with a great heart, but his mouth just got in the way too much. Dame had a lot of enemies with some of the stuff he was doing and saying whether justified or not. We can even dial it back to the backstage documentary when Def Jam made the Def Jam jackets for Rockefeller artists. Dame snapped on Kevin Lyles and Def Jam, which to me made complete sense because it was about the principle. Rockefeller paid for the tour. Now, was the delivery of what he was saying the best? That can be debated upon how you would deal with something like that. But to me, Dame was in the right because Def Jam was trying to pull a fast one, but Dame caught them red-handed. The thing that does confuse me about Dame is in multiple videos back in the day, you can hear Dame refer to Jay as his artist, which technically, he should have been referring to him as his business partner. Jay was his business partner along with Biggs. Many of y'all have probably seen an infamous clip of Dame Dash going off on the Def Jam staff about the secret marketing meeting about the Black Album. Dame is yelling at them for scheduling meetings about his artists without his knowledge. But looking back at it now, we all found out that Jay-Z actually called the meeting. Dame was losing control, whether he knew it or not, and Jay was becoming more and more distant. Choke No Joke even said that from when he was at Rockefeller until the split, Jay never came to the Rockefeller office at all. And I've heard other people say this too, that Jay was not really around much. Choke No Joke actually told a story about when Jay-Z performed for Def Jam instead of Rockefeller at the Mix Show Power Summit, which in his words was everyone coming together from the music industry and showing off their new talent the new up-and-comers of the game on your label. Choke said that this event I'm about to tell you about happened in like 2002, 2003. The weekend of the Mix Show Power Summit, Def Jam had a sponsored night and Rockefeller had a sponsored night. Dame paid for Rockefeller to have a whole day to themselves. Dame would ask Jay-Z to perform for Rockefeller, but Jay told him no, he didn't want to do that. The Rockefeller day was Saturday, but Choke said that he was walking through the lobby and Jay-Z's manager at the time grabbed Choke and told him to film Jay getting out of the helicopter. Choke was confused because he thought, why would Jay come on Friday instead of Saturday for the Rock of Fella Day? Choke would then call Dame to tell him that Jay was at the event and going to perform for Def Jam and Lee R. Cohen. Dame was obviously thrown aback by this, and it probably hurt him even more because at this time, and even still now, today, Dame and Lee R. Cohen do not like each other at all. If this is true, which I'm not calling it a lie, like I said, I was not there, but this is kind of crazy because Jay performed for Def Jam instead of performing for his own label with his own artists to give them the shine. Choke thinks that this was one of the things done for Jay to eventually get his masters back after the split. You guys got to think that the masters belong to Dame, Jay, and Biggs because they started the company together. But Def Jam bought out Rockefeller and gave Jay all the masters back to all his albums he made with Def Jam. The only album he doesn't have the complete masters for is Reasonable Doubt. You want to know why? Because it wasn't made under Def Jam. So that's why. And people last video were trying to tell me that Jay owns 100% of it, which is a lie. Because Big said in an interview with Vlad that he would never, ever sell his share in Reasonable Doubt. And to my knowledge, I don't think that Dame has ever sold his share. I'm not trying to paint anybody as the villain or the hero here, but honestly, if we look at this breakup, it was honestly inevitable. Biggs doesn't get brought up much because we didn't visibly see him a lot, so his issues or whatever, we never really heard about like we did for Dame. I think it's safe to say that Jay probably wanted Dame to play a more behind the scenes role like Biggs did. Dame was too flashy in front of the cameras and he was constantly warned with label executives whether justified or not. The industry does not like outspoken people like that. Even Beanie Siegel in an interview said that Jay kind of felt this way and that Dame should have took more of a role like Biggs did. Dame to me in those days, I don't know about now, but he could never play that behind the scenes role like Biggs did. Many of y'all know that I love the show The Wire and I'm about to connect this to a scene in The Wire. 
Dame would be Prop Joe, the Greeks would be Def Jam, Island Def Jam, and Jay-Z would be Marlo. Also, spoiler alert, if you ever seen The Wire, like, but basically, the fourth episode of the fifth season, Cheese, who was played by Method Man actually, set up his uncle, Prop Joe, to be confronted by Marlo and Chris. Obviously, Prop Joe doesn't have the same personality as Dame, but that's not the point. Marlo wants to get rid of Prop Joe to have the heroine connect from the Greeks all to himself. Prop Joe then makes a proposition that he will go away forever and won't cause problems if Marlo spared his life. People could think that Jay could have approached Dame and talked to him about chilling out and taking more of a behind the scenes role, but that role with Dame's personality would never work out. Jay must have felt like he had to do what he had to do. Business was business. Marlo knew that Prop Joe going away and changing his ways would never work in his eyes. Prop Joe was doing bad business, like Dame Dash was allegedly doing bad business. And this is something multiple people have said. Going back to The Wire though, Prop Joe would also say the lines, I treat you like a son in the scene. And then Marlo replies, I wasn't meant to play the son. Jay-Z was simply never meant to play the son role. Jay-Z always wanted to be bigger than an artist. He wasn't meant to stay with the trio forever, just like Marlo wasn't going to be under Prop Joe and the co-op forever. Dane would refer to Jay as his artist, was in a way son Jay, because Jay was more than an artist, especially to him. Jay was never meant to play that role forever. He eventually knew that he had to outgrow Damon Biggs. Marlo would say that the Greeks were cool with him taking out Prop Joe, just like Def Jam and Island Def Jam were cool with Jay taking out Biggs and Dame. Marlo got rewarded the plug for heroin from the Greeks, and Jay got rewarded most of his masters and a president position at Def Jam where they paid him $10 million a year for three years. Business is business, and it was never anything personal. I think in a future video, I can break that down way deeper, but if you've seen the show The Wire, then you definitely get what I'm trying to say. And if you haven't seen The Wire, I cannot recommend it enough, and what I said would make a lot more sense. Comment down below another scene from The Wire that you can connect to rap history, and maybe I can get a series going. Also, I'll put a link to the full scene in the description. But money, women, and power slash ego are the three reasons why Rockefeller broke up. The breakup was unfortunately inevitable, and at this point, I don't know if Dame, Jay, and Biggs can ever come back and connect again, because there's just a lot of bad blood. Biggs and Jay are back cool again, and Dame was cool with both Jay and Biggs for a little bit, but has since then took shots at Jay on numerous occasions. Maybe years down the line, they can all make up, but I don't think all three will ever have a business relationship ever again. It's a shame that Rockefeller had so much talent on their roster and we never really got to see everyone's full potential. It's weird to think that Rockefeller with Dame, Biggs, and Jay lasted less than a decade. And then everything after that was just a shell of what they had 